but they're not exceeding, not exceeding lot coverage, right? Hi, I, I'm gonna actually interject. So originally it was the admin staff that would be answering these uh, questions about any accessory structures. Um, after I had a meeting with Ashley and Maureen, I came down to discuss with Eladio, and now they forward all the questions to me. I'm the point person, and I touch, and I think we actually was on the last Zoom that we discussed it, but I actually touch upon every single point, and I, and I also make a note or let them know that even if it doesn't, I would be very aware of the lot coverage. If you have a very small lot, you need to be careful that you don't go over you know, the 20%, or if you already are over the 20%. But without a building permit, we have no enforcement of that. Right. We don't police, we don't drive around and police every property. But oh, no, we, of course not. But no, you know that. You make note, and I do comment to each person that calls, I go over each each of those points. Right. But you know what might be very helpful to the community as a whole would be to consider putting a note within the bylaw. So when you say you have the information about the sheds and what the setback needs to be, you know, maybe there would be some, I don't know if it would be a PS in there that that's something that homeowners need to be cognizant of because what I'll tell you is that we have homeowners that come before the zoning board and when they look at their existing lot coverage, they take their existing home plus their shed. So if that shed was never permitted and now it's grandfathered because it was put there and never caught, they're essentially giving themselves additional lot coverage. Um, and the other part too is that, you know, we don't want to have a circumstance set up where one individual within the town is the only one that can help people, right? Because if you win megabucks and you're that lucky and you get to move to anywhere in the world, you're not going to care about sheds in Falmouth, right? So to the extent we can put in some uniform information for homeowners, I think that will be helpful. You, you could probably also um, update. The, is that brochure that they use that people can get regarding sheds? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's all on there. Yeah, so so on so on there. Maybe they could put if they do a reprinting, or whatever, a notation about the effects it can have with lot coverage. Because you know we've seen people that say, "Well, here's the brochure I had, and it doesn't say anything." Uh, it's no fault of the building department. It's just that they're going by the information that they're just picking up. Yeah, um, and I yeah, and I would also right. on top of that point out we don't have somebody from conservation here, but where people place sheds, conservation may have a role as well. And there may be a lot of people who are unaware that they can't place sheds in particular locations based on conservation requirements. Hey guys, um, I, I want to make sure that we're able to spend a good amount of time on the actual home occupation bylaw. I don't mean to yeah, cut. We're getting too deep into sheds. <laughs> I just, I think we're getting really into the weeds on sheds. And um, so maybe we can table this conversation for a, a different time and um, just kind of spend that time on the new potential bylaw. But I do hear what everyone is saying and it does sound like this is an issue that maybe we need to tackle some other time. Um, so with that, I'd like us to shift over. That wasn't the only issue on structures because the issue the planning uh, board was having with structures was whether or not we could have a covered ground mounted solar. And it, my reading of what you presented here, um, a combination of materials that use document installed on, above, or below the surface of land, anything constructed or erected, the use of which requires a fixed location on the ground or attachment to something located on the ground appears to cover ground mounted structures. Is that the intention? And is that intention clear? Um, I, I'm gonna leave that to the building department to answer. And I'm sorry, guys, I don't mean to push it off to you, but I know that this has been a little bit of a back and forth between, I'll say some of the planning board members interpretation of what a structure is and the building, de building department's determination. So- No, I think, no, actually, Michaela, I don't think it was that. I think it was that uh, a ground mounted solar is new. So there was, mm -hmm. it, it, was no, it was never named, it was never defined. So it was unclear what it was. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the um, solar that was on the um, the the structures or the um, over the parking lot. Yes, that's right. Over parking mm -hmm. lots. Yeah, so that has that has been an item that has been discussed between the, the building department. And I, I believe it had been previously stated that those were not deemed structures um, based on a, a building inspector's determination. And but the planning board would like them to be considered structures. So mm -hmm. right. And then that's why I'm saying I'm gonna let the building department answer what their interpretation is because they they have a better understanding of what they believe a structure is. Okay. Yeah, I think too for residential, if somebody opts to have ground mounted versus on their rooftop, you certainly do want to make sure that they're not essentially disturbing their neighbors in that if you say it's not a structure, then it would not be subject to a setback either. Right. Right. Solar Ooh. is a structure. It's yep. placed in the ground and it yep. is built. Yep, so I would agree. Structure. Okay, there you and have it. For, as a structure, what about it? I was gonna say, how do you look at the lock coverage? Consider the structure, so it would be, it would be included in lock coverage. Uh, right, um, right. Buildings, the sheds, um, it's a structure, so it is included right. in lock coverage. It has to comply with setbacks. Right. Would you look at the roof area then? Or would you, because I mean, if it say it's just four, you know, four pillars, but it's a canopy. Um, so do you count the lot, the lot coverage by the roof area? Yes. Okay. Okay, and you're saying then that it does have to abide by the setbacks. Correct. And it couldn't be in a front yard. Correct. Okay. Uh, Pat, don't you think that does it? I think it does it, yes. Right. Yeah, I think um, having that clarification spelled out was going to be enormously helpful for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be best if it were named. It's got a list here, mm -hmm. includes yeah. tennis and so forth, because um, it could be in it, this with the corrections and so forth, it has to go back to town meeting. Mm -hmm. And it just is going to be better if it's named here, mm -hmm. um, ground mounted solar that it's clear that that's been added, that we're bringing it forward, we're going to get it uh, approved up front. But I think Charlotte, because again, people can have a different view of this. Okay, it's only the posts then because that's ground mounted. I think it needs to be defined that the canopy counts too. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I'd like, I'd like to include it's um, the, the canopy uh, by roof area. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll figure out some better language, but basically, mm -hmm that it is the roof area that will be um, being considered. And it says ground mounted solar. Great, thank you. Yeah. Over the uh, pillars that are installed in the ground. Right. Uh, every single one that um, we've observed that has been applied for and built. Huh. Okay. Perfect. It may be a good time to just mention that this this is part of the errors and omissions document and the definitions. We we indicated at the last meeting that we were going to essentially share these documents with you to, to show you not only where we are, but then to also uh, ask for your help. So um, at, at the risk of being the teacher, uh, this is your homework assignment for the next two years, give or take, to when you see something that's missing, make sure that we're aware of it. Um, and if you would, if you know of a, another bylaw that spells it out in a clear fashion, or perhaps there's another example that you want us to be aware of, please email myself and Michaela so that we can incorporate it into this document and we can all work uh, uh, updating it together. Okay, um, Jed, I'm not sure, where did the 40,000 square feet of surface area for the um, ground mounted solar come from? That's that's reasonably large. What about smaller ones? You could put a little ground mounted solar um, over a single car, for example. All I can tell you is that it, it was written into the bylaw that was approved at town meeting. Um, well, the but we can, yeah. 
Yeah, because can... 40,000 is just short of an acre, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's normal. So it's known as a city acre. <laughs> yeah, we could just add it as, a, as an item that you know we'll look into and we can have further discussion about. Okay, you want to think, when you do, think about small ground-mounted solar on a residential lot. You know, people put up those, um, um, I'm not sure what they're made of, they look like plastic things over metal frames. Right, right. I don't know what they're called exactly, car shelters. Yeah. You know, actually, while you mentioned that, I will bring up that there have been some circumstances with people who have looked to install, quote, hoop tents and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So I don't know if that's something you want to pull into the whole structure information portion of the bylaw, just so that people have better clarity. And, you know, they're not coming to us and saying, well, you didn't call out this one particular item. So we're assuming it's okay. And of course, you can never call out everything. But for the better direction you can provide people, I think the better off everybody will be. Noreen, do people have to come now or, or Rob, do people have to come now to the ZBA to put up those um, uh, sort of temporary car shelters? Not, not if they're temporary. I mean, I, well, I yeah, but though here's, here's the thing is that we, there seems to be no such true thing as temporary. So we did have a homeowner who approached our office and I believe it was based on an enforcement order. They had put up a hoop tent that was closer to the street than the house and close to their side yard setback. And they were told to move it to a conforming location because while you can come to the zoning board and ask for relief, it's not likely to be relief that the zoning board would grant. So I think, I don't know if Gary's here. No? <laughs> yes, he is. There you are. So Gary, are you uh, concurring that a hoop tent is a structure? Yes. Temporary structure. Right. But I guess the thing is, is, is it temporary for today or temporary for five years? At what point in time does something be is no longer temporary, right? 180 days. 180? Also, also hoop structures are actually only allowed for agricultural purposes. Otherwise, they have to have a building permit through the department. They're allowed by right for um, agricultural purposes only. Right, but for, we'll say, a regular single family residence, I would imagine it's highly unlikely that it's going to be temporary. Um, you know, we've actually in zoning also had people contact us about multiple hoop tents in what would be essentially a backyard for, I don't know, covering whatever business they're engaged in. Okay. Some things have gotten a little bit um, toward the fringes. I believe the uh, understanding of a temporary structure uh, for the 180 day use by some sort of covering for say boat storage during the off season when you pull your boat out of the water and you want to store it in your yard. Um, and we would grant a by right 180 day. Your allowance for them. All right, so you're essentially issuing permitting for temporary structures then, yes? Yes. All right, so, so it looks like we need to be working on a better definition for a temporary structure slash hoop tent. We actually have hoop structures in our listed in our, our definitions that we need to, to add. Um, yeah on the last, okay. last page there. So it, it, it has been noted that that needs to be added. And that is something that, you know, when we work through it, that, that we can um, probably add, you know, it's a temporary structure. Um, but again, not to get too much into the weeds on various mm -hmm. structures and various items, because we could do this probably all day, because I'm sure 
I'm sure we've all gotten calls about a ton of different things. Mm. Yeah. Uh, someone put up a porta potty in their front lawn for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I yeah, yeah, but I, I think, you know, identifying the temporary structures are under 180 days and with a permit from building and you're all set, right? It seems so. Yeah, I'm just I'm just making a note. Sorry. Okay, so we're we going to home occupations. Oh yeah, yes, please. <laughs> Actually, this, hoop structures sorts of bleeds into uh, home occupations. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of um, instances to bring to mind. I don't know if everyone uh, on this call is familiar with the intersection on Thomas Landers Road. Uh, just before it joined Sandwich Road, there's a fork in the road, and in that fork has grown quite the little enterprise. Uh, it looks like a, um, a tree stumper grew into a landscaper, is growing into uh, quite a business, and he's got several little temporary things going and has now added a fence to conceal the whole operation. There's, uh, you know, so his business is growing. He's going to have to make some decisions. And then on Carriage Shop Road, there's another similar one at the intersection where you could either go to Wakoit or go over to Mahoney's, I'm not too sure of the, the street names there, right at that intersection, another landscaper apparently is, is thriving and has put up a fence to conceal his whole operation. What, what happens there? Those are home occupations outgrowing their use. You wait for the neighbors to complain and somebody goes, looks? Yes. That's what happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so um, to start off the, the conversation, I guess um, kind of point one, and, and hopefully everyone um, has some time to quickly take a look at it or, or, or see it. Um, the biggest change right off the bat is that we have, we have removed home-based service business. We've now condensed it to be home occupation. Um, right. to, to try and simplify it so people aren't going, which am I, what am I, who am I? It's just home occupation. And, you know, and then you'll have to fall into one of these categories, um, you know, by right or special permit. Um, and that was just to kind of try and hopefully streamline it a little bit. So hopefully everyone was able to, to understand the layout of the document. Um, we tried to make it as reader user friendly as possible. Um, Jed luckily is good at formatting, so he helped a ton. <laughs> um, so we can go kind of item by item, you know, paragraph by paragraph, I'll say. Um, and, you know, start off with the intent. Um, we have the town that we got it from. So, you know, if, if anyone has an issue, hop, hop on. Otherwise, we'll kind of just, just go through it if that sounds good. So if it's in green, you're intending that will be part of it? Yes, correct. No matter the color, it's all going to be part of the new bylaw? Um, well, if it's if it's in purple, it's a discussion item. We can talk about whether it yeah, except, needs to be Except bylaw. discussion items, but the, the green, the red, the black. Uh, the red is a potential deletion. So the red would be, I guess, possibly deleted. The black is what is currently there and the green would be added, yeah. So green okay. and black, are staying or being added. Purple and red are maybes. And, and to clarify, the green are examples from others that we would, you're not gonna necessarily be adding all of the green. Those are just right. things that we would suggest that we consider as additions. And so there are different options to do so. So for example, in, in Michaela, you can speak to this in more detail, but in, in the intent, there's two versions of intent. There's one from Barnstable and there's one from Dartmouth. One's obviously a lot more words. Um, and I think they really get to the same point. And so the intent today, oh, sorry. No, I, what I was gonna say is that if you add Dartmouth to Barnstable, it becomes far stronger in what we're looking at for intent, the limitations we're looking for, I think. 
Yeah, and we can also, we can combine, you know, the, the two sections and, and reword them so that there's a combination of them. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely can happen. Do you think it makes sense or is it too far beyond the bylaw to suggest to people that if you have, you know, home occupation service business, whichever it is, and that if you are permitted, that if you expand, you need to return for further permission or that you're subject to enforcement or is that too much? Uh, Marie, I think that makes it clear that we do not want expansion of a business like Charlotte was talking about these burgeoning landscaping businesses. So I think it, it seems to give hurt. people notice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the difficulty is if you're a buy right, then. Why would, but Michaela, uh, why wouldn't it be easier and much, much clearer to begin in a more positive way? to say that the, the purpose here um, of regulating home occupations is to preserve the residential character of neighborhoods and to preserve the residential rights of neighbors while reasonably allowing residents to utilize these dwellings to enhance or fulfill personal economic goals. So it's clear that you're trying to preserve the residential character of the neighborhood and the rights of neighbors before getting into all these, you're, I think it's trying under the intent sections without saying, those are the two key purposes and there are two kinds, by right and by special permit. So the people now reading it have that key to what the rest of it is. You shouldn't have to look at it in order to discover that. It should say it right up at the top. Whereas here packed into one long um, action packed sentence, is too much on that intent. I think because the intent isn't clear, the rest of it is hard to discern. Okay, so the intent behind the regulating home is uh, to preserve the character of neighborhoods, to preserve the residential rights. Okay. We can right. And then say, it's either by right, and then the by right things, and then uh, where you need a permit. So just very definitely right in the structure, it divides the two. So really quickly off the top, um, I, I don't, and I'm not familiar, it just could be because I can't remember, home occupations currently that are allowed by right, are those registering with the building commissioner currently or the building department? One more time, Jed, please. The home occupations that are allowed by right currently, are they registering with or notifying the building department in any way that they're doing what they're doing? Some do, some don't. Okay. So I'll that's- get, I'll get, but, Oh, sorry. Um, so I'll get, uh, you know, someone that comes in on residents, you know, asking about businesses, is it allowed, is it not allowed? We go through it, um, if they have, to, you know, go through the bylaw, if they have, they have a meeting um, Gary, um, and then, you know, I always discuss with them what they're doing, their use and occupancy, and uh, run the business. That doesn't mean they come back in and file it. Their inquiry, if they can do it, they might be doing it, um, and if they do, So is there any objection to item number two under the intent section where it basically says, you know, again, this is from Barnstable after registration with the building commissioner. I, I would imagine just off the top of my head that maybe you'd want to do that annually. I don't know how much of a paperwork trail that creates, but is there any objection to that language? And I'm asking the group just to be clear. I don't have any objection. I don't. Why, why would you have to keep redoing it? 
Well, I think it might get to what Noreen was talking about. So it's almost like a um, an affordable unit. If you're coming in every year to say, I'm still doing the thing that I said I was doing last year and I'm proving it to you. Uh, if I start to prove to you something different, then all of a sudden there's that trigger that you need a special permit to do something uh, more than what you were doing. Maybe. Yeah. But that may be onerous though. I know. Um, what do you think we've got? I didn't, I didn't hear that. How many of these by right home occupations do you think we've got? There's probably many more than anybody knows about. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because certainly I'm when- I'm gonna have to excuse uh, me just for one second. I'll be back momentarily. Sorry. When you, you know, when you think about what might be a typical home business or office, right? Anybody with a computer doing quote work for pay, there's probably many more people than anybody would ever know about. And many people would probably never even consider registering with the town. Likely. Right. And, you know, do you really want everybody with a computer in their house to come in before the town? No. Likely not. But I, I think right. you know, obviously the problem is the people that are expanding slash moving into an area that's clearly not allowed. And right now those are caught by uh, enforcement requests. And you know, it puts a lot of pressure on residents who notice something's amiss, having to make that complaint. What we're talking about here, if I'm not mistaken, is that when you're talking about somebody who just has a computer, I mean, an attorney could practice out of his or her home without anybody being concerned or the wiser about it, even having an, an occasional client stop mm -hmm. by. Okay, but why we differentiated the home-based service businesses, that can impinge on the whole neighborhood. So you've got equipment being stored, you've got potential off-site employees coming in every day. So that is a type of disturbance to the neighborhood. And that I think should always be permitted and potentially refile every couple of years. I don't know on that. But I think we're just we're dealing with two different types of businesses here. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. you know, certainly the, the folks that come before the zoning board, you know, we tell them clearly, if you have a change, come back. And I think that's satisfactory. I wouldn't necessarily expect that somebody would need to come back every year. Right. But they say the problem comes in when you get the complaints and that people are now doing things backwards where they're coming before the board to ask for essentially forgiveness or approval as opposed to planning ahead. So I think what I'm hearing is no one is in favor of number two. Would that be an accurate statement? No, I think it's fine. Well, again, it would be the, the, after registration with the building commissioner. So I'm not sure what exactly that is. Again, this is from Barnstable. So, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm assuming it's some sort of paper trail. Yeah, I guess the only other problem I would kind of bring up to you all is that the building department, I think right now is pretty busy. And I think if you give them more to do, meaning having to keep track of businesses and um, it could just be a little bit more than you want to bite off. I'm not sure. See, I, I agree with that too. I think they have too much to deal with down there. They should be somewhere else that they're registering the businesses. Um, I don't know if it's with, and I don't know who specifically is, was assessed. I mean, you have to register the businesses because they're going to use them as a, mailing address, advertisement. And I think that's where we catch stuff now. You know, we've had people come <laughs> to us for a home occupation and then we get letters from neighbors listing the other, you know, 20 or 30 in the neighborhood, which we can't do anything about. And all those people are actually advertising those addresses for their businesses, but no one has registered with the town. 
You know, you can't, I don't think you can expect the building department to chase, you know, chase these things down on all of these no. cases. No. It's and, too hard. Yeah, and I think some communities actually use the clerk's office. I mean, I know here, I think the only people that go to the clerk's office are the DBAs, right? Because they maybe have to. Um, but again, I guess I would caution about how onerous that process would be about tracking and maintaining and who's going to follow up and chase. You know, I mean, I want to check with the clerk's department. Maybe that would work right. out. I mean, they're good at, at, um, at you know, at files and, and tracking stuff anyways. I mean, they do it with everything else. What, okay, what so purpose does the registration serve? Yeah. What, what good is that information? Well, I guess what one, there's one line in the bylaw somewhere that talks about home-based businesses. And they say, when you go before the zoning board, you know, tell them whatever else is in the neighborhood. Well, absent signs, you're likely not to know who's doing what inside their homes. So I, I can't imagine that we can accurately expect people to be able to disclose that. And we should remove that because if you can't tell mm -hmm. they're doing the home occupied business, then that's fine by us. Yeah. Yeah. And I would think certainly if you had people who are using one spare room within their home to do work on their computer or whatever else, there's no effect or impact on the neighborhood. I think it's when you're talking about employees, when you're talking about people coming to the home, when you're talking mm -hmm. about activity that exceeds the normal for a home, that's where the problems come up. Right. Okay, so it sounds like we want to remove item two. Right, no registration. All right, we will remove two. Um, so the- So I just have just one quick question and you can check with the assessor's department. The importance almost on registration is the assessor's does a um, an equipment registration with uh, assessment with businesses, um, very specifically. Um, so, you know, whether you take that out or not, I think you should probably have a conversation with the assessor and see if that's going to be an issue for them, since they actually in the taxes send out assessments for people with businesses for extra costs on equipment. That seems fair. Check on how it works now report back. Okay, so the next one, um, 249.5A requirements. Um, so we have gross floor area. Um, a home occupation is allowed provided that not more than 30% of the gross floor area um, so this is language that currently exists in the bylaws. This is in our current bylaw. Um, so just as a discussion item, is that is that a number that people feel it, they're comfortable with? Um, mm -hmm. Do we want to change it to a set amount of square feet? Um, so for example, Barnstable uses not more than 400 square feet. Irrelevant of the size of your house, it's 400 square feet. Dartmouth uses 600 square feet. Um, there are other communities that, that use a percentage as well. So is that, you know, I'm happy to leave it at 30, but just wanted to bring that up to the, uh, to the working group. My preference is to leave it. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, certainly when you have a circumstance like doggy daycare, you might say, okay, the dogs are gonna stay in the kitchen. Well, guess what? They're likely to wander into the den or something too. But you mm -hmm. know, don't really want to penalize somebody for the way life happens. Mm -hmm. And you obviously don't want somebody to take a single family home and exclusively run doggy daycare out of there. So I think if you leave 30% in there, you're staying consistent and you're kind of giving people parameters. All right, so I will, uh, I'll remove the other language and we'll leave it at the 30%. Okay, um, so moving on to outward appearance. Um, again, that first beginning of the sentence is in our current bylaws. Um, so do, 
do we want to remove the one non-illuminated non -illuminated sign um, not exceeding two square feet? So basically what we would be saying is you cannot have a sign at all. Right now you're allowed to have a two square foot sign outside. Do we want to not allow it at all? I'd be in favor oh. of keeping it. Yeah, so would I. So would I. So we will keep that and I'll change it back to black, so. Um, all right, so in doing so, I'm gonna delete the, the green language below that shows other towns that had no signs allowed, so. That brings us to merchandise. Um, we could add that items produced elsewhere shall not be brought to the premises for purposes of sale. That's not really in our bylaws currently. Um, that's, it's kind of up to the board if they feel that that should be something that should be added. It's going to be very hard to enforce because you won't know. Yeah. How are you supposed to know about that? Yeah. A friend of mine was running a little um, uh, business in her house dealing with yarn and buttons. And she brought in all kinds of buttons. How would you possibly tell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's difficult. It's you tough to hairdresser who just, you know, they bring in like one person, they cut their hair, they may sell a couple shampoos. I'm, I'm sure they're not making the shampoo themselves in their basement. I guess I hope they aren't. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that would be a little bit difficult. Yeah. But Bob, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you saying something? No, I'm just saying there's other things incidental to even if they're making stuff at home that they're going to have to bring bringing in as part of the sale. So I, it just doesn't make okay. sense to take it out. Okay, so I'll, I'll remove that. And we can, uh... So negative impacts. Um, so in our current bylaw, we have, in the case of electrical interference, no equipment or process shall be used which create visual or audible interference in any radio or television receivers of the premises. Um, quite frankly, that just, it, it, it just seems like unnecessary language. Um, I don't know of many home businesses that are by right that would have such intense equipment that would be creating radio and television interference. I guess my suggestion just in general would be that it's entirely possible that, you know, somebody starts tinkering with something and then they get into something more. And, you know, at some point in time, I don't know if, you know, maybe neighbors notice that there's multiple wires that are going into a premises or you know maybe there's some sort of power surge that's being caused by somebody doing something i mean i would imagine it's rare but i would also suspect that it's not a bad idea just to leave it just so that people are on notice that there are limitations right and that well i think we do I think we do kind of cover that in the first sentence, you know, no equipment or process shall be used, which creates noise, vibration, flares, fumes, odor, electrical interferences. So, so we do say that. Right. And, so then you don't need to duplicate. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the thing is, you know, I think we're just trying to get away from some of the, the, the duplicated language and, and the, um, you know, the one off maybe in a hundred year storm, someone tinkers with something, you know, so we do cover ourselves. Um, so I would say I would recommend that we we remove it. It seems like it's a it's a replicate replicate whatever duplication. Comment on that. We have uh, a lot of new solar being um, installed. Who knows what could occur with that? Um, I don't know how you would enforce this if you can, if you don't. You know, I'd rather I think leave the sentence in but take out radio or television because there are all kinds of receivers out there that can be interfered with. So in the case of electrical interference, no equipment or process shall be used which creates visual or audible interference. In any receivers off the premises. Oh, okay. 
I believe when we put this in, there had been an instance of something happening. And it took a long time to track back what was causing the problem. And why would you take it out? Not, oh, no, no, no. Just take out any receivers because we're limiting it to radio or television receivers. And as our tech, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, or add that up at the top as far as what you can't do. In other words, mm -hmm. just consolidate it in one location. Absolutely, that could be done too. Uh, I mean, we do, I think, have it up there in, in... No, no, I guess we don't. No. No noise. No, and I, I do know that when you may be having a problem with Comcast, what's causing it can be miles away. Yeah. And it takes them a lot of troubleshooting to find it out. Well, so you know, I think, yeah, well, I think when you lead with no negative impacts, then you're trying to provide people with some samples or examples of what you mean, but you can never pick out all of them because someone right. will dream, dream up something that will be a negative impact. So while you're giving people examples, it still provides for the flexibility for a neighborhood to come in and say, hey, Joe is doing whatever that's blowing us all up, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I do believe that we're covered when we say, or electrical I interferences. And that that's why I think this language is just uh, a little unnecessary because we are right. saying don't interfere with electricity. Um, so I don't I don't know that this sentence is needed, but you know again I, it's it is up to the to the working group. And if you guys would like to keep it, we absolutely can. Why do you have the word receiver? It seems to me we don't have receivers anymore. We have devices because true uh, something may receive and transmit, or it may process. Um, and with the world being so connected by Wi-Fi, I can think mm -hmm. of a lot more than receivers that that might be impacted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so just so you know, the, this language is what is currently in the bylaw. Mm -hmm. So um, receivers, um, if we do keep the sentence, it should be changed to devices. Yes, I agree, Frank. Okay. So do we want, I guess we'll start off with question one. Do we want to keep that language? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we want to change receivers to devices. Change radio and television receivers to devices. Mm -hmm. Radio or television devices. Receivers. No. Phrase, radio or television so, receivers delete and just include any devices. Right. Oh, any devices. Okay, so take right. radio or television. I'm sorry. Any devices. Okay. Um, and then the next sentence, there's no storage or use of toxic or hazardous materials, flammable explosive materials in excess of normal household quantities. This would be in addition to the bylaw. We do not currently have it in our bylaws. We are saying we, we could add it if the working group thinks it's necessary. It's, it's a good idea because we, we asked that question automatically and I assume I was going to just throw it in. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think it's a good idea too. Yeah. Okay, um, traffic and parking. Um, so we are suggesting, um, and it's up for discussion obviously, that we remove that a home occupation may increase parking by not more than two additional vehicles at a time, um, that parking shall be generated, or parking generated by the conduct of the home shall be provided on the same lot and shall not be located in a required front yard or within five feet. Um, and then we're saying that we could add in if more than two vehicles are parked are regularly parked in the street, uh, this will be considered an objection, objectionable increase. I would keep so, the rest of it also. I'm do you think what, Charlotte? I would keep um, the not more than two vehicles, not in the front yard. 
Yeah, I would keep it too. I, I had the question yeah. about the the question about parking on the street. So um, we don't allow parking on the street. So why would right. we even refer to it? Because that almost I, looks like it's it's okay for a couple hours. You're okay now, but uh, there just there is no street parking alone. Yeah, I would agree with maintaining the two vehicle limit. I guess the other thing I would suggest to you is if you have somebody who's doing uh, something out of their home and the only off street parking is within the driveway, which would clearly be in front of the home. I don't know that you specifically want to preclude that because I think your mission is to get the vehicles off the street, but to limit the number of them. So I wouldn't be opposed. I mean, it's one thing if somebody is doing a landscape business and they've got someone who's coming and leaving their personal vehicle for the day, right? While they go out on a company vehicle. Yeah, you would want them to park other than in the front yard or whatever. But if you're an accountant and you have somebody who comes by and you're you know, looking over material and then they're leaving, you know, somebody parking in their driveway in front of their house it's not going to be any different than a family member swinging by. Well, and that's why we suggested taking it out because how, how is anyone supposed to know that a family member is coming by on a regular basis? So I guess it becomes somewhat of a tracking challenge. Right. But I think when you say two vehicles, you're really giving people a message that you're not intending that somebody invite a boatload of people over. I mean, the zoning board has a case that they recently looked at and that was part of the problem is, yeah, you know, obviously if you have a family party, you're going to have vehicles all over the place, right? But you want to ensure that that's not happening on a daily basis. And it seems to me that if you limit people to the parking of two additional vehicles, it also helps the neighbors to know that that's a firm limit. How do you enforce that? I don't know. Same as the other. Well, I mean, it's like it's like any other, any other. It's like any other enforcement. If it's in the permit and it's recorded at the registry, the town at some point is going to have to push to enforce. Well, don't forget, this is for the by right use. So there's no per <laughs> There may be no permit here. There may just be a they're doing it. Right. So I think if, you, if you're talking by right, you want to give people a reasonable limitation. If you have no limitation, they're going to have as many vehicles as they can fit potentially. Right. But the, the first thing you have to remember, the first sentence, no traffic shall be generated in greater volume than would normally be expected. So if on a typical street, no one really has any, any cars outside and you're having 20 cars, well, that is that is far exceeding what would be expected in that residential neighborhood. Um, right, but if you don't give people some parameters, you're going to have perpetual arguments, right? I think the first red sentence could be replaced in full by the second red sentence. So it just simply reads, a home occupation may increase parking by not more than two additional vehicles at a time to be located on the same lot as the home occupation. Okay. That gives the limit. It's not onerous. I think that's fair. OK, and then keeping the second sentence, or are we re removing the so parking generated by the conduct of the home occupation shall be provided on the same lot, shall not be located in the front yard or within five years, removing that. That's what we're eliminating. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make sure I'm not, not taking too much time. And so the red sentence is in there. Yeah. And I really don't think we need the green. Yep, we're removing that because that doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, okay. So employee, um, so no person other than family residents may be regularly employed. Um, and then so the, 
The discussion is uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals may grant a special permit to one person who is not a family member to be regularly employed on the premise of the home occupation. Um, do we want to change the number of employees allowed by right? Do we want to allow two people, no people, one person? Um, what would, what, what is, what's the thought? Is there a problem with this as it is? Is, is there a to change it? You know, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think, you know, particularly if, you now are you talking by right versus special permit? Correct. Okay. This, yeah. is, this is all by right. I mean, just think about if you were doing, I don't know, whatever it was, sewing, and you have another person or two over, no one's going to care. I, I think you have other issues when it's when it's someone that's not a family member, or I think this was probably originally meant for people who are actually in the household. You know, if you don't limit this and let's say you have two or three people that aren't family members and now they're going to the property and now they're parking mm -hmm. there and then, you know, and I, I just think you're opening a can of worms. Th this mm -hmm. hasn't really been a problem so far, as far as I know. Has anyone had a problem with this in the past with the way it's written? Well, I think there's an exemption for childcare, right? And that would be one of the more common scenarios where somebody would be taking perhaps a couple of kids into their home. And depending on the number of kids they have, they might have a second person. All right, so but I think it's you're right. I think childcare is different. But I guess the question I would have to you is if you have one person who's doing childcare and they have another person come in and help them or two, what would preclude someone else from having that same number of people in their home? And ultimately, isn't the concern traffic and parking? Because yeah. then that person would add to it. And haven't we just covered yeah. that in the previous section? Yeah. Right. So I think if, yeah, if you're allowing for the parking of two vehicles, maybe you're not discussing the number of other people. I don't know. Maybe well, child child care is otherwise regulated too. There are state regulations and right. I think probably town health board regulations. So yeah. it's otherwise regulated. Yeah. The only issue isn't good. the number of employees, it's only about the parking. And to That's me, this all... sorry, Charlotte. No, no, I agree with you, Jeb. I don't I don't know that we need to discuss employees at all. I don't think so. Because you have a lot of people working remotely and we don't even care about them. Right. Uh, and then what do you, what happens if you have somebody that works Monday and Tuesday and somebody else that works Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? Mm. You only got the same number of people, but multiple employees. Yeah, and I think too, when you limit the cars, you know, that's really what the impact is going to be to residential abutters. So you're suggesting just wiping out the whole employee mm -hmm. thing. Right. I don't see why not. Yeah, I don't see why not either. I will take out number six in its entirety. So that brings us to 249.5B. This is the special permit section now. So this is everything that needs more town notice. Um, all right, so yeah, so this will, the language will be changed to, to um, home occupation by special permit rather than home-based service business. There's, there's one issue that's not really covered here. I'm not sure whether it's covered. Okay. And that's about um, by right storage. Do you, is that covered by not changing the outward appearance? Yeah, yeah so we, we, we discuss storage um, in the special permit section. Only, okay. Yeah, because basically any, any exterior storage would be changing the, the look. Appearance? Yeah, the appearance, yeah.
do you want to leave that notation in just so that people are aware that you're looking, identifying exterior storage in that way? Yeah, we could put that um, in the negative impacts. We could say exterior storage. Oh, that would be perfect. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure we already have that in number two, outward appearance. Because I think it says- Yes, you do. There should be no exterior storage of material equipment. You are absolutely right. There shall be no exterior storage of material or equipment. Did, did we cover the, the um, home occupation has to be by the resident? Is that in here somewhere? You can't be sort yeah. of printing out a little space in your house? Yeah, I think it is. It's, it's the resident is the one who has to do it. I lost track of where we said it. I think it could be an intent, that first sentence of intent. Mm -hmm. To allow the residents. Yeah, to allowing residents to utilize their dwelling to enhance mm -hmm. or fulfill personal economic goals. So allowing residents. Well, okay, but if we replace town of Barnstable with town of Falmouth, it's just a generic to operate a home occupation within single family dwellings. It doesn't say that the resident who is there has to operate it. Charlotte had recommended some language and just for the purpose so everybody can see it, I'm gonna put it into the chat right now, the language that Charlotte had recommended um, so everyone can see the language. Does everyone, can everyone see the, the chat language? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll go through and, and kind of merge the that language with the barn stool with the, the Dartmouth to kind of create what we what we discussed here at the meeting with the intent. Yeah. yeah. Do we have, and it says residential thing. So I assume it includes, um, you could be running a little home occupation in your, if you rent something or if you live in a condo, it doesn't matter what kind of residence. It's just all encompassing. Yeah, Correct. I would imagine. Yep, as long as, long as you are the uh, resident of the location. Yeah. Okay. And again, this is just the by right, correct? Correct. All right, so... Um, with that, we'll move on to the special permit section. Um, so we are recommending, again, we'll be changing anything that says home-based service will be changing to just home occupation so that if you see that language, it will be changed. Just, um, okay. So two items that we're kind of recommending that we could um, look at adding, um, a home occupation, which may have possible impacts to the neighborhood and just kind of repeats what we had discussed in the intent, but now they understand if it impacts any of those, that is what you will need. That's what's triggering your need for a special permit. You need to add to this, the business about electromagnetic, you know, um, transmissions to this list. Of things that could impact other people? I would think if you have that at the beginning where you put that ex 
exclusively as a no. Yeah. Hopefully we don't need to say it again. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're not going to allow a special permit for that. We're just not going to let you. Correct. Correct. Devices. So what this section is saying is if you do any of these things, you this is what will trigger your need for that special permit. So, you know, if you may have dirt or some odor or pedestrian traffic, you'll need a special permit. But we outright told people you cannot interrupt other people's devices. Right, and, and we don't allow odor, just saying with the Board of Health, I mean, in the Board of Appeals. Okay, the other one I, I found looking around the internet is glare. And that might be from all the solar. Um, that's, yeah, that's where it's coming from, Charlotte. Right. I guess solar. The, the question is like, are if somebody has a solar installation on their property, you're not going to list that as a home based business, right? But so where where are you going to draw the line between whose glare is a problem and whose is okay? That might become one of those beauties in the eye of the beholder things. Mm. It would fall under nuisance, Carla. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I'd leave that out of the business section, maybe, and that would just be under the general nuisance bylaw. Who do people go to for a general nuisance? Building department. Wow, building department gets every bag. They get everything. <laughs> Thank you, building department. I'm really grateful. <laughs> um, all right, so, and um, to go back to odor, do we wanna keep the word odor then? Or, I mean, cause odor could be as simple as tree cut. I think you want I think you want to keep it because years back, I think everyone will remember the coffee situation. So, right. Yeah, but I mean, don't you consider that that falls under objectionable features in general, right? So you, but here's the thing is I tell you, my mother used manure in her garden every year and the tomatoes loved it. That being said, I'm sure the neighbors walked around and pinched their nose for a day or two afterward. But I don't know that that relates specifically to a business any more than it would be to a residence. So that I would sort of say that that's covered under general nuisance. But, but if it's already in the language, why not leave it? May trigger a special permit, not will trigger it. So someone may say, and say "Hey, they're using manure," and you may say that's that that in and of itself does not trigger the need for a special permit. But it might no, and I think it's I think it's I think it's different. I don't think you can keep comparing this that if somebody uses their residence uh, normally in a daily day business, you can say that well, if you do the same thing with a business, you have to consider it the same. A business use that does something is is putting an extra burden on that property. So I don't think you could just say if somebody you know I use manure in a garden, but now I'm running a business and I use it. Well, it's only there because you're running a business. Not well, there. I guess, yeah, but I guess now there you get the bleed question, right? So for example, if I'm growing vegetables in my backyard, some of them are for me and I might sell some of them. It, you know, it could be a tough circumstance to pick apart whether something is allowed or not. That's why you have a board. Yeah. Oh, you really don't want to have people coming before the Board of Appeals because of a smell. I mean, I. Mm -hmm. I well, we get it. We get it for noise. I mean, I don't you know, I, I think that's just the way it, the system is set up. I don't think it's a choice. You know, they I would. Yeah, I would put noise under general as well, because here's the thing is that if there's a circumstance there should be some enforcement through police department or whatever. You don't want to have somebody wait like a couple of months before they're before the zoning board to deal with an issue, right? Well, so if we're taking out noise, odor, I mean, then then we, you know, smoke, I mean. 
So maybe. Yeah, so then at this yeah. time, we're, we're not really having anything that triggers a special permit. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I has think there, we, has I there think been we should leave it. I, there hasn't really been a problem having this in here. I, you know, I can understand no, doing, right. doing a change if there's mm. been a problem, but I don't think there's been an issue. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's no harm in leaving it. I wouldn't <laughs> say that somebody would specifically be coming before the zoning board for a home occupation that was going to create odor, right? Because the zoning board probably just initially is going to say no. If somebody was generating something, I don't know, whatever, chemicals that were going to pollute the neighborhood, they're never going to get a permission to do that. If it hasn't caused a problem, why change it? Commonly included um, needing a permit would be seem to be from just the internet. Odor, dust, smoke, vibration, noise, heat, glare, electromagnetic interference that can be detected at or beyond the property line. And we've already got that in already under a negative. Right. So what I, I guess what I'm suggesting is we leave it. Sure. Let's leave it. Because actually, well, this is actually fewer negative impacts than under negative impacts. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, do we want to call these specific ones out or do we want to just refer back to negative impacts? Well, because the negative impacts we do include, I mean, we can, but, you know, there is no storage of toxic hazardous materials. And then there is no visual or audible interferences of the devices. So this is just saying, these are the things that will tr that might possibly trigger you to need a special permit. Mm -hmm. But what I'm all what I'm adding though is that this is much smaller because we have noise, vibration, flare, fumes, odors, or electrical interferences. Because those are not allowed at all, so you can't get a special permit for those because they're not allowed. Okay, so why wouldn't we be taking out? noise, I want to see other rest. Is, is that actually correct? I thought what we have is the kind you can do by right is when you don't have those things to create an impact on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you might need a special permit is if you have those things that do create an impact. Mm -hmm. So the difference isn't whether you have them, the difference is the impact beyond your own property. Correct. Now you, now you need to go talk to the ZBA and find out whether you need a permit or you can do it, not do it at all. Mm -hmm. It might be forbidden, you might get a permit. So, so in theory, impact separates them. So we could refer back to those sections that we just outlined in the by right and say, if you exceed these, go see ZBA. But it would be easier to, to rename them, but make them identical names. Mm -hmm. or, you know, same list, different impact. So, oh, you know, I somehow can't picture the zoning board granting somebody a permit for a home based business that's going to cause impacts to anybody in the neighborhood. I mean, that's the exclusive cutoff, right, for being able to do this is that you're not causing a problem. Well, when do you need a special permit? What would you have? Okay, yeah. what's the trigger for a special permit? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I would let people be within the parameters. And yeah, I guess that would be the question is. Well, think, for example, if, if I'm if I do some welding, maybe I'm a plumber, but I weld some of my pipes on my property. Welding may create an odor. It may create smoke. Um, would you do you, you know, can that be allowed on the premises on the property? Um, I think that would be something that, you know, could come before the ZBA for a special permit, whether you allow it or not, you know, just as an example of something maybe that would be a possibility. Well, it's a how much is too much question. This is like the expanding landscape business. Mm -hmm. At what point have you got too much equipment on the property? At what point have you got equipment running uh, a lot so that it's not a little noise occasionally? 
it's a lot of noise every day or some noise every day, or it's not some smoke, it's a lot of smoke. It's how much is too much. And I guess the other part to that point is that we, we talk about noise, you know, asking neighbors to prove, well, how noisy is it and how much? I mean, it really, people are entitled to certainly have some peace and quiet within their homes. And they shouldn't have to be overstressed to say that somebody next door is running band practice 24 seven, right? So I think, you know, some of the intent in the bylaws in general is that you have those no-nos listed at the beginning, right? Where you say, hey, these negative impacts are not gonna be allowed. Now, what we're talking about in green here is actually Barnstable's language, mm -hmm. but it's been put in here because we're separating special permit, um, home occupation by special permit out as a segment. So when we keep saying that, well, it's not causing any problem for us currently, well, it hasn't because we haven't defined it so carefully for special permit. Well, well, you have. So the remainder of this section, special permit, anything in black is where you really get into the weeds or we currently get into yeah. the weeds on what does and what doesn't and it really gets involved. Yeah. But I think yeah. the intent here was to simply sort of, to Charlotte's point earlier, sort of just give a introduction, a very brief introduction mm -hmm. uh, paragraph and just to say, hey, look, if you play outside the sandbox, uh, you're gonna need to file a special permit. But I think we can refine that language and just refer to the other sections, the by right sections, and say if you exceed something like that, then you know it just sort of lays the groundwork. And then in more detail, which we'll get to in a second, this is where it really gets into the weeds on what exactly we're looking for. You know, and I think the other part, maybe it would be good to sort of cross-reference that here, is that the zoning board also uh, grants permits for vehicles over a certain gross vehicle weight. And, you know, so maybe that would be part of the PS to somebody would be that if you're exceeding, you know, this or that, that you would need or storage that you need permit for that. Um, but speaking of gross vehicle weight, and I know we're bouncing around, we have had some inquiries from folks who maybe got a job with a particular company and they're looking to you know, drive their work vehicle home. And so that was an internal discussion that we had about whether the town would wanna reconsider the limit, maybe the gross vehicle weight for that. Because it seems a little bit unfortunate that, you know, for example, someone's son got a new job with a company and he's driving this vehicle home and he's parking it in his driveway and it's not particularly oversized or out of character given the size of vehicles nowadays, that somebody then separately has to come pay a couple hundred dollars for permission to be able to park. Yeah, we actually, we do further down have that as a, a discussion item. Um, Perfect. For that exact reason. And also just who is going out and weighing these, these trucks? Who, I'm not, I'm not gonna go out. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you that right now. It's not gonna be me, so. Um, no. Yeah, we can definitely um, discuss that just as a, to be the, the time person. It is 1250. Technically, yeah. the meeting is running until one o'clock. Um, I'm not sure on if we're allowed to extend, if, even if we want. I don't know. I guess we I don't know on if we're allowed to like extend it. So but I just wanted to make everyone aware um, that, that is coming up. Uh, have, we gotten, have we gotten through what you wanted to do today? For the most no, part, we haven't we haven't gotten into the serious parts about what we don't allow and yeah. do allow. Yeah. And you apparently are suggesting giving special permits for all kinds of truly objectionable things. You know, that's my goal is just come in town and allow everybody objectionable things. <laughs> no, I I like all the I like all the objectionable things under a no no. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Um, so, well, we can, you know, we prove these things now. What was that? 
would the ZBA approve these things now that are listed in the rest of this? Well, I think to be fair, so the rest of this is existing language and we just combed through it and said, what are some of these really specific items that maybe we consider deleting because we don't need them anymore? So for example, A and B, is there a problem or it, has there been a problem in the past with those two things? If there currently still is, all right, let's talk about keeping them. If not, is it too specific to be putting in here? And I believe there was talk at the last meeting that we, this language might not be needed. I mean, if why, if it's a pre-existing non-conforming law, does that make them not be able to have a, have a home occupation? It, yeah, I, I absolutely don't agree that somebody having a non-conforming law has anything to do with it. Okay. I agree with you, Noreen. I would, I would absolutely be in favor of removing that. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then same with the non-conforming minimum yard requirement. Um, yeah. yeah, again, because if somebody's doing something inside their house, the size of their lot means nothing. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. And it is under special permit. So if whatever they're proposing cannot take place, like storage of a vehicle or something, they don't get the permit to do it. Right. All right. So moving on to A, I, first dot. Um, so we're recommending removing some of this language. You know, all company vehicles must be kept on a driveway, in a garage, within a screened area. Um, we we kind of we already say that they need to to do this, um, unless specifically approved by the board. No ungaraged company vehicle shall be parked overnight within five feet of the property line. Um, you know, again, some of this we already we already really cover, so. Do we need to go back and, and repeat these things? I mean, certainly some of that is not in keeping with you know, the modern day use, right? Agreed. Where do you say that we already cover that? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it. Uh, for parking. Um, <clears throat> I thought we had a section. Well, you're not allowed to have street parking. No, I don't see that being covered. I'm sorry, I thought I thought we had covered that specifically. Uh-uh. Well, I get I guess the question is for the first bullet. You know, technically the the language that says driveway kept in a driveway, we cover that in the second bullet with no more than two company vehicles maybe kept in the driveway area. Do we mm -hmm. need to have driveway and garage? And is it is it in the in intent to completely screen these vehicles again because they're by special permit from the adjacent properties? Or are we assuming that? You know, we know that it's a home occupation by special permit. It's more than a by right use. So we anticipate having these vehicles there and we would anticipate being able to see them. You understand what I mean? Yeah, but Jed, I would keep that in there because this is under special permit. It was specifically carved out as a home-based service business because there was a lot of annoyance going on with what was happening. And okay. when these things are mentioned in here, it was that kind of thing that was creating the annoyance. So they were specifically covered. That doesn't yeah, mean think, have to go yeah. into the future yeah. doing what we did. Yeah, I mean, I think you certainly have a problem in a residential neighborhood mm -hmm. if somebody is exceeding what you would typically expect, right? So for example, right. If I'm a plumber and I have a vehicle for myself, yeah, that should be fine. But if I'm a plumber and even though my 
other people aren't on my property, if they're leaving their trailers at my park, you know, when you start to get that right. exterior change that is changing the nature of the neighborhood, I, I think it's unfair to people to have to deal with. And exactly what you stated is why I'd want to keep this limitation in because we are dealing with a, a separate segment yeah. of what could be by right. And this is no longer by right. We're saying why. Right. And what you're saying, Pat, applies to is this C, all the things that are now in red, bulleted in red, you're saying keep them. Because keep I would them. agree with that. I yep. think that we should. These yep. are exactly the kind of things that, that continue to cause a problem. Things mm -hmm. too close to a lot line, too many things um, not kept out of sight. All right, so we're gonna keep um, bullet one, two, and three. We'll keep all. Correct. Okay. And it looks like under um, italicized two uh, on the next page, the maximum amount of exterior storage, we should keep those bullets also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess, so for example, that first bullet. Now, if I have a 17 foot trailer, that's fine. But anything 18, or I'm sorry, it, let's assume I have a 19 foot trailer. Not okay. Well, I guess we're getting into, in my opinion, we're sort of getting into weeds that it's, what's the difference between an 18 foot trailer and a 20 foot trailer? And the, I'd leave out the feet, including trailers. Perhaps, yeah. Just, you know, you got any trailers there? Let's discuss it. I mean, it's don't limit it. Okay, so all there, exterior storage, including trailers. When this was done, we went into a huge discussion about this 18 feet in bed length. I, I think it has to do with um, the way they're registered. Uh, I, I think over a certain length, you're registered commercial plates. Okay. And that's probably why, even though we're looking at it as just lengths, that's why most people don't have an 18 foot trailer or a 20 foot trailer because you use it for, you know, bobcats and heavy equipment or, so I, I think it has to do with that. I know that when we go through a lot of our permits, we actually ask, you know, how they're registered and do you have plates for them? And uh, I seem to remember it has to do with the lengths. Okay. That makes the size sense. Of those. But it wouldn't be about the length, Bob, is that what you're saying? No, I think the length does. I think it also relates that they have to be commercial. So it's a business use. It's not personal. Um, but you can take a trailer that was meant for personal use and now be using it in your in your business. So that you on can the smaller ones. Small. But I think when they're a certain length, I think they can't. I think they are automatically registered commercial. I, I, I don't think you could get a 20 foot trailer and say that it's you can't register it personal it, it goes under a, a commercial registration which then is business which means it's business use right but what i'm saying is i i don't know that that's germane you could have a series of small trailers and that's what you're using for your storage and that would be unsightly so if you just leave it including trailers no length specified not to do with registration just trailers used for storage should be completely screened from view. Yeah. I wonder if that wouldn't even be something that you would want in the general bylaw somewhere, as opposed to just in business, because you really don't want even individual homeowners. Well, all right, we're not allowing trailers. We're not even right. investing trailers. Right. Well, the only thing I would say is when we're saying certain trailers, I mean, some people have a boat trailer. Um, but again, this is under business use. It's not under personal. So it's not like someone that just has a boat. It's because of a home business or an occupation. So you look at it differently. And, you know, like Noreen said, when we look at them, if it's a, if it's a business and we think, uh, let's say they have a bunch of small trailers. Well, yeah, we ask that they be screened in or. If, if, if we think it's going to be an issue again for the character in the neighborhood. Yeah, you got to differentiate this from, you know, we keep doing these comparisons, but what if I have a boat trailer? What if I have a small trailer? The difference really is these are 
business related uses, not personal. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I was just meant more in the general bylaws, like putting them in the general. Um, you know, what, what would that trigger? But as far as for this, this specifically, yeah. yeah, I agree. So we'll, we'll take out the 18 feet and put all exterior storage, including trailers shall be completely screened from view. Um, with that said, as the timekeeper, it is now 101. Um, so I don't know if we have to end the meeting, if we, if people even want to continue it, I don't know. May I suggest that we just get through this, this item and then we can adjourn? That makes sense. Yeah. It okay was me. Everyone agree? That sounds great. Um, all right. So the next bullet, any exterior storage shall not be closer than 30 feet to any off-premise dwelling. Does any, do people want to keep that? Move it? Oh, I've got a different copy than I have. My next thing is about employees. Nice no. What? No. Is that right? No. no? Mm -mm. There shall not be more than two employees. Mm. Wrong page. No, that's the next item. We're going down to the next bulleted item. So we we fix the trailers, and then right below trailers, there should be a couple, like three more bullet points. Oh. We're still doing the bullets. I thought we had covered those. Okay. Uh, do we just want to keep all of those? And maybe I, I, I may have misunderstood. We're keeping all of these in there. I thought we had just specifically talked about that first bullet, but I may have misunderstood. I thought it was all of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is everyone in agreement we keep all three of those bullets? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Well, that's nice and... By the way, did we, under discussion above, did we decide we should rename home-based service business to home occupation by special permit? Right. I think that would be wise. Home-based service again. Home-based service is deleted. Right. I think we should do home hmm. occupation by special permit. What if you put the term service within a paren somewhere just so that it provides for a link for people who are used to the old bylaw and just so that they don't think that something went away and now it's okay that okay. sort of reference to them that you know that you're consolidating uh -huh. anyway we hadn't discussed that that's why I pulled it back up no thank you I, I think I had actually just um i I had changed it to black, but when I was changing some of the other things and I, so thank you for that. Um, so we have home occupation by special permit is the language we're changing it to and, and maybe adding in um, service somewhere. Well, after home occupation by special permit, we could put in parens service. Okay. Noreen's concern is that somebody looking at it would say, where did the HVS, you know, where did that go? Yeah, or, or even if you even if you put it at the very beginning where you're talking about in general home-based occupation slash service, and that maybe you just put service in parens just so that people know it didn't go away. And mm -hmm. then yeah, you're not just allowing everything. Yeah. The section. It'd be 240-9.5 home occupation parentheses service. And then that works. Okay. Okay. So just for clarity's sake and, and perhaps just my sake too, um, we plan to meet with the Bobs next week. And I believe our intention was to sort of provide them with our rough draft of this home occupation bylaw so that we could discuss it in more detail with them at that time. Now, obviously adjourning today without finishing it, I'm just throwing it out there for the group. Do we want to plow right through? I know we just decided, but we want to plow right through, finish it all so that we have something for them to consider or do we want to just finish it up with them? We don't have that much more to go. I'd rather plow through it. Yeah, I think you want to have it done, right? Yeah, let's go. Okay. okay. 
So the next item is the employees. Um, so we're, we kept it at um, one non-resident. Um, so do we wanna take out the section where however limited employee visits to the business to pick up work assignments or supplies provided no such visit shall occur more than twice a day. Do we wanna take that out? Do we wanna leave that in? Um, no, I do I wanna leave it. You live it in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Leave it in. That works. All right, hours of operation. Oh, now just by one employee, we have actually had a landscaper who had like two part-time people. So together, those person equal one full-time equivalent. So I don't know if you want to offer that flexibility. You know, it seems to make sense if you have people wor working part-time for somebody that you don't want to penalize them by having a second person who's putting in only a couple of hours. There should not be more than two full-time employees. Yeah, or, or equivalent. Or full-time equivalents. Yeah, yeah. Equivalent. That gives them some flexibility. There shall not be more than two full-time or equivalent employees who are not family. Yeah, that, that can be eight people coming and going. Yeah, I think that gets complicated. Oh, that gets really... It, that can because be you can really use that to your advantage as the business person, and then you can't really enforce it. Mm. So just leave it at two employees, and if somebody complains, right, yeah. then you've got a basis for decision making there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So hours of operation. Um, do we want to remove no vehicles used for delivery or pickup purposes shall exceed thirteen thousand pounds of gross vehicle weight? Um, I will leave it in. Oh, I was going to say I'd be in favor of getting rid of. I think the problem, and again, I'm not a person who understands and knows vehicle weights, and I don't know if Ashley's still on this. Yes, she is. Um, if she has an idea on that, but I know, like I say, we've had problems in the past with vehicles, especially where everybody's vehicles are getting larger. You know, at what point in time do you really want to penalize somebody who's got a larger vehicle, but it's not, you know, like a tanker truck, right? At the point when it's a dump truck. So what does, say, uh, a Ford 150 weigh? Yeah, but don't a lot of people that are, don't a lot of people have those as like their passenger vehicle slack? They do. They do. Yeah. So you want to be sure that you're including an ordinary truck like that, but not including a small dump truck. Right. I would say that one of the reasons for the pound limitation is, remember, we're talking about residential neighborhoods. The yep. roads are not constructed to right. same standards. Yeah, Gary, do you have a good idea on that? You've been in the business. And as far as a pickup truck go? No, so how to define the difference between someone that would be using their their vehicle you know their pickup truck or their whatever you know is something that would be standardly at someone's home versus where do you draw the line between now somebody's got a commercial vehicle that's excessive for a neighborhood a thousand pounds how many thousand ten thousand pounds ten thousand because 13 we have right now and mm -hmm. 13, we've had people contacting us saying, you know, they're, that's what they're driving for their work vehicle. Do you think they were fibbing? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I would just love to see a little bit more flexibility so that we're not telling people who have a vehicle that they bring home, but you don't want something obnoxious for the neighborhood. Right. I'd leave it as is. Yeah, it hasn't been a problem. I would just leave it. Yeah. Again, a lot of these items haven't been an issue. Mm -hmm. I, I know you're taking them out, but they really haven't been an issue. Yeah, just to, I totally get what you're saying. Some of it we, we just thought maybe might be repetitive or, um, 
you know, lengthy in word and, and didn't need to be there. Not necessarily that it, you know, it had been an issue or anything, but I, you know, we're fine with leaving it in. And that's, that's why we brought it up to you guys as a discussion. So we're, we're fine leaving it in too. Um, if it hasn't been an issue, why not as a general rule, leave it because it provides additional guidance. Mm -hmm. Well, I think as we're going through the bylaw, part of it is to, to take out some of the wordiness that is the Falmouth bylaws. Um, yeah, I think simplifying is usually a really good thing to do, mm -hmm. but on special permits, you're really trying to, particularly for home occupations, you're trying to indicate things that are, are just borderline on the appearance of the neighborhood. This is all maintaining a residential feel and somehow you don't want dump trucks. So you want that conversation to occur in some way. No, that's that, yeah, that's fine. And you know, like for the next bullet point, um, we can we can leave that in. Um if you know if that hasn't really come up and that hasn't been an issue, and we can leave that language in. You know, actually something like a dump truck would require a commercial plate. So maybe that could be something that you would be including as well so that you're kind of notifying people that if you've got a vehicle that is of such substance that you're required to have a commercial plate, maybe that you would- have a commercial plate for even a small vehicle, isn't it? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just, it, it just me drive it I wouldn't want to have a dump truck parked next door to me every day. No. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could just make our lives easy and say no dump trucks. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, just joking. Um, all right. So no, well, no objectionable vehicles. Right. <laughs> so should we keep in the you know, business activities and the motorized equipment? Um, yeah, I don't see any issues with any of those. Keep them all yeah. that, that's, yeah. that is, we'll keep in all those bullet points, that's fine. Yeah. So that actually brings us to section two. And so do we, again, want to keep this language in? The board shall consider the cu cumulative effects of allowing more than one home occupation located in any given neighborhood. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you do you really have a way to track slash police that? That was kind of our question. Was is there is that a, is that even kind of allowable? Like, it, and I was going to say, is that even fair? So, say I'm a plumber and you live across the street and you're an electrician. So now I can't use my home as my office address because you do. Yeah. I kind of well. Seems like a well, first well, service. Well, for example, that, take a drive. Take, what was that, Bob? I can't. So for example, take a take a drive through in a commercial district. Um, and not everybody can have a drive through. Once somebody gets one, the next properties next to it are all limited. You have to be so many distances. It's the same idea with this. If you have a, let's say you have a home based business, and now someone wants to run a weather directly next door. Let's say you're on a cul de sac. And now that's going to cause a problem because there's two businesses operating the same times and they're on that side of a cul-de-sac on the yard. You'd want to at least look at it, see what each business does, you know, what kind of traffic each one would, would generate cumulatively in that area. You'd want to at least have the, have the right to look at it. Doesn't mean you're going to say no, but you have to at least consider it when you're actually giving the permit. So are you saying that this would come forward only for circumstances that require a special permit, right? Yes. So if, if you're an accountant and you live next door to me, neither one of us, you know, we're both coming, we're both under the allowable threshold, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, my neighbor across the street works from home. My husband works from home. Town doesn't know. Right. And no, even and if you're Right. Plumber, yeah. Or or an electrician, and you simply have vans there. You're not right. causing a problem in the neighborhood. This no, gives exactly. a lot of leeway for the special yeah. permitting, the ZBA, to say yay or nay. 
Yeah, just just allows you to consider it. Doesn't mean you're going to say no. Mm -hmm. we, can, the we can leave that language in. That's fair points. So we'll actually we'll leave them. We'll leave both in then. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. don't know how or whose responsibility it is to prove what is there or not. Well, they could both, if they, if you gave a special permit on a one property, now the property next door is going for one, you already know what the first property was because you gave the permit. Right. So you've got something, to, if you didn't know it was there, that's it. But, but in those cases, you know. Yeah. But there may be people who just do it anyway and don't go for a special permit. You're not going to know. No. You can only but go by the information not... you have. If it's not creating a problem in the neighborhood, you hear whispers around town if there's a problem, um, then I don't see that there is a problem. Okay. The well, problem comes in when you're getting these much larger vehicles that say, okay, you've got to have the space to park it. They have to be shielded you can't just plunk it down in your yard. All right, so we're gonna keep both of those bullets. Mm -hmm. And with that, we have- Vehicles and storage. It's both things. It's the storage and the vehicles. Right. Yep. Uh, excuse me, excuse me for one minute. I'll be right back. Well, we've reached the end of the document anyways. We're actually, we're done. We're, we're, yeah, we're gonna yeah. adjourn. <laughs> oh, perfect, hallelujah. <laughs> well, well, with that, yeah, we, we've completed my task list for the day. Make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Aye. 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 Aye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.